jättekort. Please be seated. The presiding judge, we're resuming the hearing. It was a good thing that we adjourned the hearing. Mr. Duschat, we were interrupting you when you were speaking. But there were some damages and technical issues that we needed to resolve. So please proceed. Thank you. It would be much appreciated if the prosecution, when it responds, as just uh, it just did, to stick to the facts, because then it's good, you know, if there are questions, that would always give us the opportunity to explain matters, and I shall do so now. I hear the prosecution say, or I heard them say just now, that since the autumn 2019, we had come up. I think prosecution knows that it was on the 16th of January 2020 that we started to act on behalf of Pulatov. So it's not since the autumn. Prior to that, so prior to the 16th of January 2020, we were not in touch with him. In any case, not about the case. And there was no reason to be in touch with him. Late February 2020, we could start studying the case file. So we started to prepare a defense before the previous hearing, so that was March 2020, before that, we were able to meet our client. But that is insufficient to build your entire defense in that period of time. That is why we intended, and I said as much, I can be quite open about this, to spend two weeks over there. The prosecution says in so many words that it's uh, Pilatov's choice, it's his decision to restrict contact. That's what the prosecution says, but it's not Pilatov, it is Corona. For that reason, there are restrictions in our contacts, uh, which is why we, as counsel, have said that we have had insufficient opportunity to prepare. That doesn't mean to say that we haven't done, in, done anything. Quite the contrary, we worked very hard and we did a lot. And that doesn't mean that we're not going to do anything in this block of hearings. All it means is that the, that it's not every that we haven't been able to do everything we would have wanted to do. The prosecution then. Uh, has questions with respect to the necessity of personal contact. The prosecution says that a generous 200 pages would have been translated into Russian, which is about 0.5% of the entire case file. And so this is a case file that is so big and so complex that the prosecution will spend nothing less than two or three days to explain the course of events. We're not talking about the substance of the file for that. They need much more than two or three days. I understand that as well. But two or three days to explain the progress in the case file. In a couple of months, and half of this time, we had the corona restrictions, and that, that is insufficient. As far as I'm concerned, that uh, doesn't require any further explanation than the explanation I've already given. Thank you. The President of the Court. So now I think it's time to proceed to the explanations and presentations on, the, on behalf of the prosecution. And later on, we'll be commenting on your response and uh, the course of events in this block of hearings. But first we're going to listen to the prosecution. Over the next few days, the prosecution will be presenting the investigation that was conducted over the past few years. The purpose of this presentation is to allow your court to issue a judgment on the question whether 
the investigation that was conducted is complete and whether the case is ready to be judged on the merits. And of course, the file is decisive in answering this question, but a presentation on the part of the prosecution can help us. And this is also the way in which the prosecution can publicly render account of, with respect to the investigation so far and the decisions we took along the way. The purpose of a presentation in this stage is ex explicitly not to give you an overview of the evidence or to draw conclusions on what can and cannot be proved. A public overview of the evidence can only be made once the defense has been given the opportunity to supplement the case file and once your court has heard the case in substance. But we can give a presentation on the type of evidence that has been gathered, gathered and also on which grounds the public prosecution has reached the conclusion that parts of the investigation have been completed. In several cases, we'll be referring back to findings that have already been disclosed by the JIT and have been presented at the hearings of the 9th and 10th of March. We're quite aware that relatives and other interested parties have been waiting for a long time and are very keen to know what the results of the investigations are, which conclusions can be drawn with respect to what happened to flight MH17 and who is responsible. But the accuracy of this criminal proceedings must take precedence. Of course, the prosecution in cases like this one can and may disclose restricted information, information that is required to reasonably meet the public need for clarity and information. And this is exactly what the JIT did. But a full picture of the relevant evidence in terms of criminal law can only be provided when we deal with the substance of the case at a time to be determined by your court. Today and over the next few days, we will be giving a detailed presentation on the course of events in the investigation. We will start by explaining the situation, the situation in the area where MH17 crashed and the parties involved in that situation. After that, we shall proceed with a presentation on the investigation into several sources of evidence, such as forensic traces, telecommunication, witnesses, photographs, videos, digital sources, radar data, and satellite data. Subsequently, we will explain how, based on those sources of evidence, we conducted investigation into the course of events leading to the crash of flight MH17. An investigation was done into several scenarios. The scenario of an onboard explosion, the scenario of an attack by a fighter plane, the scenario of the use of a different ground-to-air missile other than a book missile, and the use of a book missile. Within this um, last scenario, we conducted investigation into possibly, pos different possible firing sites. And a target investigation was focused on the Ukrainian and Russian bug systems. And we will be providing details and explaining our investigation into all these scenarios. We will then explain the investigation into the operations of the book system. We will then explain the investigation into the suspects. First of all, we will be discussing how the investigation evolved into the individual roles of the accused with respect to the charges, and subsequently, we will be explaining the investigation into the question whether there are any impediments with respect to their prosecution. And in between, we will explain why we feel that separate parts of the investigation have been concluded and finalized. And finally, we will dwell on the question as to which further investigation has yet to take place.
organisatie in Oost-Oekraïne. Let me start with the situation in eastern Ukraine. In order to properly understand the investigation, one needs to know a bit about the situation in East Ukraine in the period prior to July 17, 2014. Flight MH17 was shot down in a war zone. In East Ukraine, at that point in time, there was an armed conflict between the Ukrainian government and several armed groups. This armed conflict had arisen earlier that year. From February 2014 onwards, in the regions Donetsk and Luhansk, government buildings were being occupied and armed groups were being formed. These groups declared that they aimed for independence of parts of Ukraine and aimed to join the Russian Federation. These groups started to use structural violence against competent authorities and also against civilians that were not sympathetic to their causes. The members of these groups are also called separatists in the media and in the file. The investigation, however, shows that many of these fighters of the Donetsk People's Republic, the DPR, and the Luhansk People's Republic, the LPR, that those fighters were not Ukrainians driven by the wish to separate. In many cases, these fighters are Russian citizens that travel to the Ukraine to fight there. And this term, separatist, is not in all cases the most appropriate term to be used. But we're using this term as a generic term for the armed combatants that were fighting against the Ukrainian armed forces. On April 7, 2014, the armed group that occupied the regional government building in Donetsk declared that the Donetsk People's Republic, the DPR, had been established. The DPR became active in the Donetsk area and organized according to, to different units. At the head of the DPR was the so-called Prime Minister Alexander Borodai. The accused, Igor Girkin, was appointed in May 2014 as the so-called Minister of Defense and therefore hence became the highest in command. In that same month, in the Luhansk region, the Luhansk People's Republic was declared, the LPR. The separatists of the DPR and the LPR occupied several areas in eastern Ukraine, and the Russian Federation played and plays an important role. We'll be discussing that at a later point in time. These people republics, the DPR and the LPR, are not recognized by the international community. So they're not independent countries or areas or regions where armed groups occupied those areas in Ukraine. The Ukrainian government started, by way of response, started with the anti-terrorism operation, which focused on dismantling the armed groups and liberating the occupied areas. The area around Donetsk, which is being controlled by the DPR, and the area around Luhansk, being controlled by the LPR, in those areas, fighting is going on as we speak, sometimes interrupted by a ceasefire. In the first half, in the first half of July 2014, this is an indication of the areas that were occupied by the DPR and the LPR. You see on the screen, you see a purple area, and this is the area of which both parties, the Ukrainian government and the separatists, agree that that was the area that was controlled by the separatists. And the positions of the DPR and the LPR were regularly attacked by Ukrainian authorities. The firing site that was referred to by the JIT 
in Pervomaisky, south of Snitsin, and also the crash site of MH17 in July 2014, were located in the area that was controlled by the DPR. This crash site has been indicated by approximation on the map. You see the green circle. And the route of the trajectory that was referred to by the JIT as being the route that the book teller used, the book teller that shot down the MH17 to the firing location, in part goes through the territory that in July 2014 was being controlled by the LPR and also in part the territory that was being controlled by DPR. You can see it on the map on the screen. And particularly in the context file, we find detailed information on the armed conflict. Participants in the armed conflict, information on the front lines and developments in the armed conflict, particularly prior to July 17, 2014. And also the hierarchy within the armed group of suspects was described in this file based on open sources and intercepts. We paint, a picture was painted of who was issuing ordered orders and who was executing orders. And an investigation was conducted into the role of the Russian Federation in the armed conflict in East U Ukraine. We'll be talking about this in further detail later on when we discuss how we investigated whether the suspects can invoke immunity from criminal prosecution. Elsewhere in the case file, there's also information that was incorporated regarding the situation in eastern Ukraine on and around July 17, 2014. For instance, the situation at the Ukrainian-Russian border, the downing of military aircraft prior to 17 July 2014, and the need for anti-aircraft defense on the part of the DPR. We will now proceed to discuss the situation at the site after the crash of the MH17. That situation had an enormous impact on the investigation and what could and could not be investigated immediately after the disaster. As we highlighted, the crash site of the MH17, the green circle, was located in a conflict zone that at that point in time was being controlled by the DPR. Access can only be obtained with the permission of representatives of the DPR. Observers of the OSCE, the Organization for Safety and Cooperation in Europe, investigating officers of the Dutch Safety Board, and the international delegates of the repatriation mission were allowed access. And also journalists could access the crash site. They had to take into account that there were combat operations, artillery fire, but they also had to keep in mind that there could be land miles and that there was a, a danger that they could be taken hostage by armed groups. In the first half of 2014, many people in this area of the DPR had been deprived of their freedom for a shorter or longer period of time, including journalists, observers of the OCSC, and staff of the Red Cross. Also after July 17, 2014, many people, including journalists, would be denied their freedom, deprived of their freedom in the DPR-controlled area. These war conditions made it very difficult to conduct forensic and other investigative uh, measures made it very complicated and initially even impossible. Furthermore, a more vigorous approach of a criminal investigation at the crash site would entail a risk of a negative reaction of the DPR, which could hamper repatriation of the victims and the work of the Dutch Safety Board. It was only a year after the crash in the summer of 2015 that to a, very to a very restricted extent, we could proceed to conduct investigation in the area. The conflict situation in eastern Ukraine made it very complicated, or even more complicated, to approach witnesses. Obviously, we need to take into account the safety of witnesses. 
and the way in which we overcame these difficulties will be discussed when we discuss the witnesses later on. Not only the war situation at the site, but also the active obstruction of the investigation, particularly on the part of the Russian Federation, have made it very difficult to conduct an investigation. The obstruction on the part of the Russian government officials were already, was already explained in March. Several other people tried to obstruct the investigation by time and time again drawing attention uh, to evidentiary material that ultimately turned out to be falsified or simply didn't exist. In many cases, these people appeared to be driven by a desire for money or attention for themselves. And there are indications that m several of these people were paid by the Russian Federation. Despite these challenges, a thorough criminal investigation has taken place and ample evidence was obtained from many different sources, also from Eastern Ukraine. And we will now proceed to discuss the different parts of the investigation and my colleague will take the floor. As my colleague just said in the general introduction, the JIT investigated various sources, forensic traces, telecommunication, witnesses, photos and videos, footage, digital sources, radar details and satellite details. And the investigation into these sources has been described in various locations of the file. We will now first explain how the investigation to every into every type of source has taken place. Before we do that, we would like to address in general the manner in which the reliability of these separate sources has been tested. On the, at the hearing day of the 10th of March, we said something about that, but we would like to remind you briefly. When discussing the separate sources, we will address it in more detail. As of the beginning of the investigation, it became clear that various parties point at each other with regard to who's to blame for shooting down MH17. As of the start of the investigation, it was also clear that the results of this investigation would not be met by everybody with an open view. That is why we took extra steps to validate the evidence, and we followed three lines in doing so. First of all, we checked authenticity and reliability of individual sources. And in March, we stated briefly how we did that by means of separate telecom data and photo and video footage. Secondly, the separate results were described in coherence with other evidence sources in the file, such as forensic findings, witness statements and satellite data. The coherence of the various sources of evidence can be found in the case file and in the file for alternative scenarios. A wider background, inf wider background information is provided in the context file. In that manner, the investigation results can be compared with each other and be assessed in the right context. Thirdly, we tested the reliability of the sources by trying to find alternative evidence. In order to assess reliability of witness statements or telecom data about firing a book rock missile from the DPR area, it is also relevant whether we can find evidence that MH17 crashed due to another cause. As such, we've investigated the possibility of an onboard explosion on board MH17 and 
an attack by a fighter jet. Furthermore, scenarios were investigated that MH17 was fired by another surface-to-air missile than a book or, when we depart from the book scenario, that a book missile was fired from another location than the one at Pervomaisky and by another party in the armed conflict, the armed forces of Ukraine. That was a brief summary of the validation of the evidence that we've obtained. We will now explain how we've conducted the investigation into the various sources, forensic traces, telecom data, witnesses, photo and video footage, digital sources, radar and satellite data. And all these various sources of evidence will return later in our explanation of the investigation to the various scenarios. And we will also mention specific examples to make it clear in what manner we've investigated validation of these various sources. And we will now start by explaining about the progress of the forensic investigation. We will do that by taking three steps. First of all, we will explain why no forensic investigation could be conducted in the disaster area, the area where MH17 crashed. Then we will describe what forensic investigation we could conduct and which questions were answered. Next, we will discuss on key matters what findings we've done in the forensic investigation and what was the further investigation conducted. And then we reach our intermediate conclusion about completeness of the forensic investigation. Now, first, access to the disaster area. My colleague just highlighted that. Flight MH17 was shot down across eastern Ukraine and landed in a war zone. The occupants, their possessions and wreckage of the airplane landed in a field of about 50 to 60 square kilometers around the villages of Rabove, Petropavlivka and Roshitne. And you can see it in the map on the left top side of the screen. The area was controlled by DPR, but there was still fierce combat going on. Therefore, no forensics investigation could take place, as would normally be done at the site of a crime. First priority after the disaster was to recover the bodies and personal possessions of the victims and to identify these. And access to the disaster area could only be obtained with consent of DPR fighters. And since the governments of the countries with victims and the DPR when, uh, did not recognize the DPR, the contact was made through the OCSE. And the OCSE was active in the area as a neutral monitor and reporter on the conflict with the assistance of OCSE, we gained access to the area. In the first days after the disaster, local incident response teams and the inhabitants of the area had already recovered many victims and possessions, and these were transferred to a team of international specialists and then flown to the Netherlands through Kharkiv. Up to 2015, Malaysia, Australia and the Netherlands have organized various international repatriation missions in order to search the entire area and to recover all the victims. And it was always done with the assistance of the OCSE. Because of the war situation, they could not do it in one time and various missions were required to do so. The recovered mortal remains and possessions of the victims were taken to the Netherlands every time to be identified. And from the Dutch side, the identification was performed by the National Team for Forensic um, Investigation, the LTFO. It was formerly known as the Disaster Identification Team. The LTFO operated on the assignment of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And in spite of comprehensive and uh, thorough investigation, um, the remains of two victims could not be identified. Identification took place in a barracks in Hilversum, and at the same site, the mortal remains of the victims were also investigated forensically for possible traces of a crime. And we will address that later. 
That was the first priority. So repatriation and identification of the victims. The second priority in the disaster area was international aviation investigation. It wasn't an investigation into who was to blame, but into the factual cause of the crashing of flight MH17 so that safety lessons could be drawn from it for the future. The international aviation investigation took place under the supervision of the Dutch Safety Board. And various other countries participated in that investigation, including Malaysia, Australia, Ukraine and the Russian Federation. After most victims had been recovered, the Dutch Safety Board contacted representatives of the DPR to gain access to the crash site the disaster area. And when it had obtained such access, the DSB recovered wreckage of MH17 between November 2014 and May 2015 and transported them in trucks to a barracks in Gilserijen in the Netherlands. In Gilserijen, these wreckages were attached, seized by both the Dutch Safety Board and the Forensic Investigation Team and investigated together. And we will address that later too. In the first stage after the disaster, repatriation and identification of the victims and the international aviation investigation into the cause of the disaster had priority. Criminal forensic investigation in the DPR area could have interfered with these other important efforts. Therefore, and also because of the persistent fights, no forensic investigation was conducted in 2014 in the area where MH17 landed. After May 2015, when repatriation of the victims and the recovery of wreckage had been completed to a large part, it was different, but then forensic investigation on site was hardly useful anymore because it had already taken place in the Netherlands and was taking place in the Netherlands. Investigation into the remains and possession of the victims and the recovered wreckage. In June 2015, there was some forensic investigation into possible firing sites and transmitters, telecom transmitters by a small forensic team from the Netherlands. Because of the persistent war, not all targets of that investigation could be achieved. Besides that one investigation mission in June 2015, it was not possible to conduct investigation in the area controlled by the DPR because of the safety risks for the witnesses and the investigators. A report of the circumstances in the disaster area is included in the file in the general um, uh, explanation and the partial file LFT LTFO and the um, official record on the disaster area. And in the final um, official record, we also refer to open sources such as the final report and the substantiation of the investigation of the Dutch Safety Board. Um, details uh, of parliamentary discussions and the report of the evaluation of the National Crisis Management Organization Flight MH17 of the University of Twente. Without, the, uh, in spite of the limited access to the disaster area, a lot of forensics investigation was conducted. We mentioned the uh, examination of the remains and the possessions of the victims and the wreckage of MH17 after they had arrived in the Netherlands. It was only part of the full forensic investigation by the GIT into the downing of flight MH17. We will now provide you with an overview of that. The forensic investigation is described in the um, report by in the file of um, forensic investigation and the separate partial files of the sites where the forensic investigation was performed, Hilversum, Wijk bij Duurstede, Gilsrij, Ukraine, and in Finland. The uh, supporting official records and the expert reports are included in a separate annex file. Before I continue the progress of the investigation, first of all, the questions in the investigations and the, manner, the mode of operation. First of all, the framework. At the start, the following questions were 
phrase, and you can see them in a frame on the screen. Was there an explosion, and if there was an explosion, was it on board or off board? Based on the forensic investigation, can we assess what type of weapon was used? Specific air to air, surface to air, and also within the two categories, a further type of weapon that was used. And the final question, based on forensic investigation, could we establish a firing site? These questions were only answered based on the traces that were found and the an expert analysis of that. So these questions were not answered based on other sources, such as tape conversations, footage, or witness statements about a weapon or a firing site. And in this way, the results of the forensic investigation have independent value as evidence and can be used to test other evidence sources or other means of evidence. Furthermore, the forensic investigation was conducted within the GIT. It means that forensic investigators and experts from the GIT countries have consulted each other about these questions. And the type of investigation that should be performed to answer these questions. And we will address that at a later stage, too. At a later stage, too. Something about the nature of the investigation. Forensic investigation uh, focuses on traces. It means that several objects or remains are examined to find physical traces that can say something about the way uh, an event happened. Traces can provide clues about what happened or who did so. And these traces are then secured in a forensically um, uh, proper way so that they can be investigated later by experts, for instance, by the Netherlands Forensics Institute. The um, trace in, uh, examination of traces uh, on mortal remains has a large impact and therefore it has been executed in a very careful manner. And we will explain how it was executed. It may sound businesslike and detached, and the Public Prosecution Service understands that this explanation may be very painful and confronting to relatives, but in order to assess the completeness of the forensic investigation, we also must discuss this. As we've explained before, most of the remains and the wreckage were recovered by uh, other parties and taken to the Netherlands. Up to 2018, uh, material was submitted by local, uh, by, by local citizens. After these remains and wreckage arrived in the Netherlands, we started the forensic investigation. At the same time, Every time we would ask the question, do we see something other than to be expected after a plane fell down 10,000 meters? And if that was the case, the relevant body of a victim or the relevant object was investigated further. The forensic investigation was performed in various countries and on various sites. In the Netherlands, the investigation took place in Hilversum. Wijk bij Duurstede en Gilserijen. There was also expert investigation taking place in The Hague at the Netherlands Forensic Institute and in Amsterdam at the Netherlands National Aerospace Laboratory. Furthermore, forensic GIT investigation took place in various sites in the Ukraine between 2014 and 2016. Additional Dutch investigation was performed in Finland in 2015 and Belgian, Australian and Malaysian experts performed additional investigations in their own country. The comprehensive forensic investigation was a joint effort. Experts with various expertise have performed investigations, each separately, together with each other or in cooperation, alongside each other or in cooperation. We will address the investigations at the various sites. First of all, Hilversum in the Netherlands. The forensic investigation started on the 24th of July 2014 after the first bodies of the victims arrived. These bodies 
were recovered by uh, local incident response teams uh, between the 17th and the 21st of July 2014. And the examination in Hilversum uh, aimed at finding foreign bodies in or on the bodies of the victims. And we mean anything that should not be in a human body. Various workstations were designed to be able to execute these specialist forensics examinations of the bodies. First of all, workstation one, what we call workstation one, and measurements were performed with regard to hazardous substances. This was for security reasons. Then workstation two, and you can see that here. It was a CT scan. All of the coffins with bodies um, were in examined with a CT scan, and the scan um, distinguished between metal material and non-metal material, and a radiologist would uh, assess the CT scan. The next step was workstation 3. This was triage by a forensic specialist, an explosive expert, and a pathologist. Triage is a term used in forensic investigation for sorting and selecting. First of all, the coffin was opened, and then the human remains were visually examined. And based on that visual findings and the scan report of the radiologist, it was decided whether additional forensic examination had to take place. The key question was all of the time whether or not there, was, there were injuries that were inexplicable or whether there were foreign bodies found that couldn't be explained. In the first case, and you can see it on the left-hand side, further forensic examination was performed. And in the second case, if it wasn't inexplicable, the injuries or the foreign bodies found, then the remains were transferred to the national team uh, forensic investigation um, to investigate into the identity of the relevant victim. When triage was a reason for further forensic examination, the body was first examined with another um, radar um, scanning um, device. And it could distinguish between various types of metal. Based on this scan, there could be a more detailed investigation on or in the body. And in some cases, it was decided to perform um, a full um, uh, examination by a forensic pathologist. During the process in Hilversum, relevant materials were found. And as such, the GIT announced earlier in September 2016 and 2018 that particle, uh, metal partic part particles were found in the bodies of the crew of MH17, and these were secured and investigated in more detail. After completion of the forensic investigation, and you can see it on the left-hand side of the screen. After completion of the forensic investigation, the remains went back to the work station of the, LAN, of the national team of forensic investigation for identification. At another site in the Netherlands, in Wijk bij Duurstede, there was investigation of the uh, personal possessions that were recovered in use Eastern Ukraine. And the uh, aim was to test for materials uh, that were not typical for those positions. And we have footage of the procedure. You can see um, what happened during that procedure in the video footage.
So everything went through an X-ray scanner, as you've seen, in order to detect metal particles. And the findings of the scan then informed a decision of whether further investigation was required or not for a given item. The same applied to the uh, investigation of the bodies. Foreign matter was removed and stored safely so that further forensic investigation could be carried out. And during this triage, again, a relevant material was found. In among the victims' belongings, for example, part of the upper left-hand side of the fuselage of every 17 was found. That, in other words, was something which should not have been there. And that part, that component has also been preserved and investigated. After this investigation, the forensic investigation, the items that did not need to be further investigated were returned to the relatives. This was carried out via a company called Blake Emergency Services, which I'll just call Blake or Blake's. Blake's first cleaned the items and then handed them over to the relatives. In one case, Blake found some relevant particles in a bundle of documents beginning, belonging to the MH17 crew. There's the aircraft copy of the takeoff charts, and in the file it's sometimes referred to as the green file. This set of documents was then further investigated by forensic specialists. A number of metal particles were found there, which were comparable to the ones which were found in the crew members' bodies. We'll come back to that in further detail later. Now, Gilza Ryan. Here, the wreckage was investigated. They were carried out by the Dutch Safety Board in the disaster area in Ukraine, and then they were transferred from Ukraine to the Netherlands. And at the Air Force Base in Gilza Ryan, all the components were examined. The purpose was to get an image of the damage and guarantee the protection of evidence. Evidence in this case is any matter which does not belong to part of the aircraft and also explosives. Anything that is not part of the aircraft we will call foreign material. So the Dutch uh, safety board organized three convoys, the first having 16 trailer lorries, the second with eight containers and the third with two smaller containers, carrying all the wreckage to the Netherlands. Every item of wreckage was photographed and numbered in Gilles Orion and then inspection, inspected visually. During the inspection, it, the decision was made whether it was part of the MH17 or not. If so, the part of the aircraft that it was was identified. And in assessing this, specialists from the aviation service of the National Police brought their expertise to bear, and also information from the aircraft manufacturer Boeing. Here, the forensic experts and the aviation experts worked together with the aviation experts from the Dutch Safety Board. Each had their own task and their own responsibility. In addition, samples, known as swabs, were taken to see if there was in the, uh, explosives in the wreckage. There's a picture of uh, this particular investigation and you can see swabs being taken. Some items could not be identified as parts of the MH17. These were called foreign material. They were put aside for further investigation. That might be loose items, which had found themselves in amongst the wreckage, or they could be items that had got wedged in. When I say wedged in foreign material, when that happened as part wedged into part of a component, the entire piece of wreckage was set aside. And any wreckage which was not comp compatible with a fall were also put set aside. You can see examples of that here. An example of that would be perforations. Those items of wreckage were also investigated separately. separately. And finally, a number of items of wreckage were separated for further examination. That brings you to the end of the research in the Netherlands. Now move on to, the, to Malaysia. As you said, the forensic specialists had no access to the disaster area in East Ukraine. If they had done so, they would have stood in the way of the investigation and the repatriation missions. 
For journalists, it was different. They were able to have access to the, air, to the disaster area. Malaysian investigators took pictures and compared them with the photographs which had been in, taken in investigating the wreckage. And then they were able to identify the component parts of the aircraft that it was. On the basis of this, it was to a large extent possible for forensic evidence to be identified and see what condition it had been in shortly after the MH17 was down in the wreckage area. Here you can see pictures of a left wing, left wing tip identified during this forensic examination. The findings of the Malaysian examination were carried out in a report of 1,170 1, photographs, which is part of the file. And now we'll move on to Ukraine. We mentioned earlier that uh, Ukraine had been examining the possible location of origin of the missiles, and forensic specialists in 2014 and 2015 had also been carrying out other investigations in other parts of Ukraine. The purpose of this investigation was to identify reference material and data of the probable weapon, the Buk missile and the launcher, which we call the Taylor. The reference material was needed in order to compare with the foreign matter which had been identified examining the aircraft wreckage in the Netherlands. Forensic specialists from the Austrian Federal Police, AFP, and the Netherlands recorded the findings. And we will briefly go through the investigation that was carried out in Ukraine. In early October 2014, at Malin, two missiles of the 9M38 series were dismantled. It's a particular series of book missiles. One was a 9M38, which is in the up picture, and one of the newer type, 9M38M1. These missiles were dismantled and separated into four separate parts. The nose, the warhead, the motor section and the tail section. Thereafter, in late October 2014, in Shostka, three of the four items that had been dismantled were examined further. Here, this was the warhead. You can see that top left-hand picture. You can see two in a single case. The motor. That's the top right-hand just one moment. Yes, top right hand picture and the tail. Bottom picture. It turned out that both missiles, both missiles had the same type of warhead. You can see them in the picture. You see it's labeled 9N31M, 9N314M. I just point out the letter H is a steric N. So it's 9N314M. That's the newer version of the old 9N314 warhead. The two warheads look the same. So the different missiles had the same warheads. They're grey, they're barrel shaped, they're metal at the ends and have a glass fiber shroud. They were inspected visually and then dismantled, and the whole of the outer shroud was pre preserved so it could be used for later comparative investigation. In the warhead, two layers of explosive were found with pre-made metal fragments. You can see them on the right-hand side. These are supposed to cause the damage to the target. When the explosive is ignited, they then are released and fly out from the missile in all directions at great speed. And that is in order to, of course, hit the intended target. Fragmentation material from the warhead was preserved for comparative research. The preformed fragmentation particles were, formed, were of three types. A larger fragment in butterfly shape, you can see that in the top picture, 
and two smaller fragments, one of which was rectangular, you can see that in the lower picture, and the other in the form of a rod. You can see that between the butterflies in the upper photograph. The racket motor, the, the missile motor, was made rendered harmless at the base in Shoska by incinerating the fuel. This went together with <laughs> cause presumed production of a great deal of white smoke. And then the soil on which the missile fuel had been burnt was then collected for further comparative investigation. After this, the tail was also made harmless by burning the fuel. And here again, reference material was collected for further comparative examination. In the first half of November 2014, in Malin, the nose sections of both rackets, of both missiles were investigated. The nose section is in two parts, which are connected by a middle section. These two sections are separated so that the components in the nose could be investigated separately. And in the nose, there's the automatic pilot and a system which guides the missile to the target, that is to say the radar and aerial. Here again, reference material was preserved for further investigation. After the investigation, the two dismantled missiles were brought to the Netherlands and there they were used for this comparative investigation. In late November 2014, at Danilivka, the book Taylor, I'd say one of the two launchers, was investigated. And the other, in, the other vehicles which are part of the book system were also visually examined. You can see them in the picture. Top right had a picture, the Taylor with the white missiles. And in 2015, soil samples were taken in various locations which had been identified as possible locations from which the missile had been launched. Moving on to the next country, Finland. Here, a book missile, missile was dismantled and scanned in 3D. This was a 9M38M1 missile, that's a new one and also with a 9M31M warhead. You can see the warhead on the picture. This took place in late October 2015. And here, images and scan material was made available by the Finnish authorities in January 2017, so it could be used in the investigation. In October 2015, an arena test was also carried out in Finland. What we mean is an arena test is that the front part of the book missile of type 9M38M1 with a 9M31M warhead was detonated. In this way, it was possible to investigate the speed and the direction of the fragmentation parts coming from the warhead, and that was important in calculating the possible location of launch. Aluminium sheets were installed in a circle around the location in order to imitate the in order to imitate the outer layer of the aircraft. These are called the aluminum sheets. And they were placed as a kind of shield, and they show the harm caused by the fragmentation particles. In addition, the arena test, test gave us an idea of the condition of the fragmentation parts and other components of the missile after detonation. After the test in Finland, these aluminum sheets of the fragments and the other remaining parts of the missile were preserved. And in fe February 2017, Finland handed them over to the Netherlands for further investigation. In order to register the distribution and speed of the fragments from the warhead, high-speed cameras had been installed. Because tests of this kind are very rarely carried out, Trial and error was required in order to get the right settings for the cameras. But later, it turned out that the pictures from the initial arena test in Finland were not 
usable in further investigations. For that reason, the JIT decided that it would take, carry out two new arena tests in Ukraine, one with only a 9N31M warhead and one with a complete missile of the 9M38M1 type. In addition, the decision was made in order to measure the missile's thrust, or thrust profile, as it's called in the paperwork. This was important in calculating the possible location of launch of the missile. In order to prepare these further arena tests in Ukraine and the measuring of the motor's thrust profile, experts from Ukraine, Belgium and Netherlands dismantled three more 9M38 M1 Buk missiles on the 23rd and 24th of June 2016. Here again, they each always found a 9N31M warhead. And these missiles and warheads were then re made ready for detonation in Shoska on the 30th of June 2016. In addition, a 9M38 M1 missile was scanned in 3D. After these preparations, the tests were carried out. And what happened was on the 2nd and 15th of June, July 2016. Here there were Dutch, Belgian, Australian and Ukrainian specialists involved. The test was carried out with a warhead alone, and the second was carried out with a complete missile. In addition to the aluminium sheets, which I showed you earlier, from Finland, frames with compressed plates were also installed. Prior to the test for the whole missile, the thrust profile of the motor was measured, and that was done by detonating the motor. After that, Samples of the residue of the fuel were retained for further investigation. First, I'd like to show you an example of how the thrust profile of the motor was measured. The light grey block contains and supports a prepared missile motor with a fuel tank and an exhaust, or venturi, venturi as the exhaust is sometimes called. And at the front of the missile motor is the measuring apparatus. And you can see again all that white smoke and the darker smoke. I mentioned the white smoke earlier. And you saw a, a jet of flame coming out of the Venturi. And you could hear the, the sound, but I don't know whether it was easy for you to hear the, 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 the whistling sound. And the intensity of the fuel of the flame lasted for approximately 15 seconds and was then reduced. It reduced, produced a great deal of smoke, as I said, firstly white and then black. And the measurement of the thrust profile produced very important information, as I said earlier, for calculating where the missile had been launched from. Now, there's an aerial view of the test in Ukraine, or the two tests in Ukraine. And here, this is an aerial view from straight above. This is the uh, image, in fact, of the test with warhead. The same test was carried out twice, first in at real speed and then at reduced speed. The image was taken from the outside of the arena test location, so I'll show you first at speed. That's the accelerated version. And you're looking at the back of the aluminium sheets, and you see initially on detonation you have a, a ball of fire, and after that the fragmentation the particles are fired out at great speed. You can see that from the, the material flying into the air. You can also see it with pieces bouncing off the aluminium sheets. This resulted in the total destruction of the arena test equipment. You can see this therefore before the pressure wave. The arena test of the warhead showed only the primary damage on the sheets, only in other words the damage caused by the fragmentation particles in the warhead. 
when the weapon, the book missile, is used. You don't only have the warhead causing damage, but also other parts of the missile. And that is why a second arena test was carried out with a complete NM 38M1 missile. And we'll, I'll show you pictures of that in a moment. This test showed a complete image of the damage caused, not just the primary damage from the fragmentation particles of the warhead, but also the secondary damage from other fragmenting parts of the missile. And there again, the aluminum sheets were hit by this. I'll first show you an aerial view of the arena test set up with a big image of where you can see the missile in the arena. Then there's a lateral view through the opening in the arena. In order to make it easier to identify the particles of the missile after the test, a number of sections were painted different colors. You can see that here as well. The test will be shown to you once at reduced speed. And in this test, with the whole missile, you can see similar reaction to the test with the warhead only. You have a ball of fire followed by fragments flying at high speed and then the pressure wave. The missile breaks up into pieces larger and smaller. And here you will see two component parts circled in red. That is the venturi, the exhaust, and the engine shroud. You can see the red circles on the right-hand side, the Venturi, and on the left, the engine shroud. In this arena test with the complete missile, there was both the primary damage caused by the warhead and the secondary damage caused by the other parts of the missile that clearly revealed on the aluminium sheets. Both arena tests were recorded with high-speed cameras. On this occasion, the images were successful. We can clearly see what happens after the detonation with the, the missile, the warhead, and the aluminium sheets. After the Finnish and Ukrainian arena tests have been carried out, the, the items from the warhead and other parts of the missile were and the aluminum sheets were recovered and were transferred to the Netherlands for further forensic investigation. And the same happened with the samples of residue from the incineration of the missile engine. The further investigation was carried out in cooperation between experts from a number of countries in the JIT. Back in the Netherlands, the arena tests were recreated. You see them here in the image. Thus, we could see how far the fragmentation parts could be spread and how much they could penetrate. After that, we can see the deformation and the mass loss of the fragmentation parts. After detonation, that was researched in Belgium and the Netherlands. The parts of the missile that were recovered in Finland and Ukraine were then used for comparative investigation. And here, the, part, the recovered parts of the missile were compared with the non-aircraft material, which had been found in the victims' bodies and possessions and in the wreckage of the MH17. And the comparison was carried out by the Dutch Forensic Institute, NFI, on the basis of the elemental composition of the materials, among other things. And in addition to the Dutch Forensic Institute examination, specialists were brought in by the Australian Federal Police, AFP. They carry out visual comparison between the foreign material found in the aircraft and the components of the two book missiles of, of 9M38M1 type, which had been dismantled in Ukraine. Here we can see a number of distinguishing features, such as, for example, the molding shape, uh, 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 manufacturing signs, and a number of magnetic characteristics. After this test, the Dutch police carried out a visual comparison between these non-aircraft materials and the remaining parts left over from the missiles which had been recovered during the arena tests. So 
first comparing two different kinds of dismantled missiles, and secondly, the comparison with the missile part components after detonation. In addition to the comparison of foreign material with the reference missile part components which had been preserved, the Dutch Forensic Institute also compared the non-aircraft material with itself. This again looked at a number of different features. And in this way it was possible to see whether some of the non-aircraft material which had been recovered could be from the same source and possibly even from the same weapon. The comparison carried out by the NFI also used a, an, undamaged, an undamaged missile of this type which had been dismantled in Ukraine in 2016 and 80 fragmentation parts had been removed from it. So if you look 2014 and 2016, you can see the following comparison or reference material has been collected. Fragmentation particles and other components of an undamaged 9N31M warhead from Ukraine which had been dismantled and fragmentation particles and other parts of 9N31M warheads which had been dis dismantled and detonated in the arena test in Ukraine and Finland. In addition to those components, there were also components of two undamaged missiles of two times, 9M38 M1 and 9M38, which, which both came from Ukraine, and then the detonated 9M38 M1 missiles from Ukraine and Finland. I hope that you can still follow this story. Finally, the data gathered during the unit tests, such as the thrust profile of the motor and the spread pattern of the fragmentation particles, were analyzed by experts from the Dutch NLR and the Belgian Royal Military Academy, RMR, in order to calculate the location from which the missile had been launched. This takes you through then the main steps in the forensic investigation. More than this was done, but it is not relevant in terms of the findings it came up with. For example, we mentioned earlier that soil samples were taken at a number of locations in East Ukraine because at, at locations which were possible launch sites. The samples couldn't be taken until June 2015, so almost a year after the MH17 was downed. In a number of regions, beg your pardon, in a number of cases, the possible locations were in fact very large, which means that the soil samples were necessarily pretty random. And comparison material was also taken on a military base in Kramatorsk in July 2015, that's in Ukraine. At this location it was possible to see that book missiles had been launched from there, specifically on the 9th of December 2014 and the 10th and 11th of February 2015. These samples were taken fairly recently, or fairly shortly after the launch, and no no ignition residue was found. And because nothing relevant was found in these comparison samples from which we knew for certain that a book missile had been launched from there less than six months earlier, for that reason experts did not expect to find any relevant evidence in the soil samples that had been taken where it was thought that the missile could have been launched more than a year ago. Other Research also showed that the residue of missile fuel evaporates quickly. The Dutch Forensic Institute decided that the investigation of the soil samples is unlikely to yield anything very useful. And therefore, in 2015, it was decided that the East Ukraine soil samples should not be investigated further. The other investigative actions I carried out did come up with some findings. And on the basis of these, the forensic questions were to be answered. If you remember the questions, I put them up on the slide again. Firstly, was there an explosion? If what there was, was the explosion 
inside the aircraft or outside it? Secondly, can we find what kind of weapon was used? And finally, can the in forensic investigation identify the launch site or launch region? And the investigation could only be completed after the answers have been found to these questions. And the answers on the basis of the findings of the forensic examination were then important for other parts of the investigation, which I'll be talking about later. For example, the investigation of a number of different scenarios and the main scenario. And that's why, when discussing the forensic investigation's intermediate conclusions, we'll also run through the findings which were relevant in deciding whether or not further investigation should take place. Here, I'll give you a general description of the damage pattern on the basis of the wreckage, the non-aircraft material that was found in the wreckage, the non-aircraft material that was found in the victims' bodies, and loose non-aircraft material, and finally, the calculation of the launch site. In addition, we will give you a description of the further investigation that was carried out in the light of certain findings, such as the petaling effect, the number of fragments found and the origin of non-aircraft material. I'll come back to that in a moment. Now is not the time to go through all the results of the Forensic Institute in great detail. That will, we'll come on to that at a later stage when we discuss the substance of the case. Firstly then, the general pattern of damage on the basis of the wreckage. In Gilser Island, a reconstruction of the MH17 was made using the wreckage which had been recovered, and a 3D scan of it was made. You were shown this earlier at the JIT presentation of the 28th of September 2016. So here you see a scan. It's still there in Gilser Island. The visual inspection of the reconstruction revealed that the damage to the aircraft was mostly on the left front part of the cockpit. The damage consisted of hundreds of large and small holes on the left-hand side of the cockpit at the front and also the left wing. The left wing is not shown in the image. It, it was recovered. In addition, a number of uh, non-penetrative damage was found on the outer side of a number of, uh, of the uh, wreckage components, such as dents and glancing damage. The right-hand side did not have any such damage. This showed that the left-hand part of the aircraft was where the damage took place. Soot damage could also be found on, part, on the outer side of parts of the cockpit. Soot deposits are found when, when you're close to the location of the explosion. These were sampled, the, the soot was sampled in Gilser Iron, and above all, they are found at the front part of the aircraft. During the visual inspection of the wreckage, perforations, dents, and glancing damage was identified. These show that unidentified objects had come passed from outside the aircraft to the inside. The metal plate was also very often dented inwards. The Dutch Forensic Institute investigated these dents and perforations in order to see what materials had caused them. And in the dents, Unidentified particles were found. These were in investigated to find their elemental composition, and the NFI came to the conclusion that most of the dents and perforation had been caused by impact of steel. Then further investigation was carried out into the composition of the steel residues which were found in the dents and perforations. I, earlier, we mentioned the fragmentation particles of the 9N31M warheads of Ukrainian book missiles were recovered and made available to the NFI as comparative material. The NFI then examined the elemental composition of the steel fragment particles of a book missile and compared them with the samples of steel that were found in the dents and perforations. 
After the arena test with the complete book missile, similar dents and perforations were found on the aluminium sheets and on the frames. The pattern of damage as identified in the wreckage could therefore be compared with the pattern of damage that was identified after the book missile had been detonated in an arena test. In addition to dents and perforations caused from outward, outside to inside, some petaling was also identified. These are bulges outwards, and these might appear at first to mean something passing through from inside the aircraft to the outside rather than from the outside in. That does not appear to be compatible with other evidence of an explosion taking place outside the aircraft. In the area test, further investigation was carried out to see the purpose of these outward bulges, which are called petaling. After the area test, the same petaling was identified on the frames. So that is dents passing outwards, particularly in locations where plate material had been pressed by rigid steel particles. The Belgian Royal Military Academy therefore concluded that the outward petaling was not a contraindication, that meaning there could not have been an explosion on the outside of the aircraft. Summary then, the general summary of the investigation, the pattern of damage to the MH17, the soot deposit on the outside of the fuselage and the dents and glancing damage to the fuselage on the left-hand side of the aircraft and also the dents and perforations indicate an explosion outside the aircraft, particularly towards the front left of it. The composition of the steel residues that were found could be compared with the elemental composition of the steel fragment of the steel fragments in the warhead of a book missile. After the arena tests with the book missile and warhead, petaling was identified. For this reason, petaling of MH17 wreckage does not show that there was not an explosion outside. So this was a summary of the general findings concerning the pattern of damages. This brings me to the investigation and research into non-aircraft material in the wreckage. We will discuss only limited results of the investigation because they gave reason to conduct further investigation or are elemental in our conclusions. We've already referred to the report of the Dutch Safety Board and uh, part of these results were presented in September 2016 and May 2018 by the JIT. First, fragments that were found in several pieces of wreckage and also flight documents. I'm referring to 341 steel fragments. Part of these fragments were found in the nose of the aircraft, namely the front pressure bulkhead of the co cockpit. Of the fragments from this cockpit section, the one had a very recognizable bow tie form and the other had a shape of a rod. And on, here on the images, you'll find the bow tie portion and the other one that can be recognized as a tile. The shapes of these fragments, so both the bow tie and the tile that you just saw, the rod that was found, could then be compared to the fragmentation particles that were found in the 9N314M warhead, the reference material. Now, based on these findings, this visual comparison, further investigation was conducted into the distinctive nature of the bow type fragmentation parts. According to Russian sources and the Dutch um, Aerospace Center, the bow type, the bow tie shaped fragmentation portions only appear in the 9N314M warhead of a buck. Missile. The older version of this warhead, the 9N314, there were not three but two different 
kinds of fragmentation particles. According to Russian sources, the 9N314M warhead only comes in the 9M38M1 missile during the forensic investigation in Ukraine when the warhead uh, was dismantled of both types. It uh, appeared that the new warhead was also fitted in the older 9M38 missile, which is the predecessor of the 9M38M1. The Dutch Forensic Institute conducted investigation into the different uh, features of an ample selection of these steel fragments, the 341, and similarities were found in the elemental composition and manufacturing features of these fragments. The features of these fragments from the debris could then be compared to the fragmentation parts of the reference material, the dismantled 9M314M warheads and fragments that were secured after the arena tests in Finland and Ukraine with the 9M314M warhead. So besides these fragments, these steel portions, in several parts of the debris, other portions were found that clearly do not belong in an aircraft. One of these parts is, has been discussed during a JIT presentation in September 2016. This is a green metal cluster, which is as big as a golf ball. AP describes it as such, and it was wedged in the frame of the left cockpit window. The visual features, the shape, dimensions, the cutting traces of this cluster were compared to the two dismantled Buck missiles by the AFP. And in this comparison, there was one element that came up, which is the base plate of a sliding system of the two Buck missiles. The tail section of the Buck missiles with a slide. The connector point is covered with which the Buck missile is connected to the launcher vehicle. The Dutch Forensic Institute then compared the elemental composition of the cluster that was found with the base plates of the dismantled reference. Missiles. Besides this part, this element that we're showing now, there are more non-aircraft materials that were found in the wreckage. You'll see some fragments here. These are other components, other elements that were found in other parts of the cockpit in the left wing here. So there were other elements here than those fragments, and also the interior of the cargo door, the right cargo door. And the elemental composition was compared to the different elements of the reference missiles. If those elements or, or sections were large enough, they were also compared with the visual characteristics of the reference missiles. The NFI also looked at the paint, found paint on this non-aircraft material, and that was compared to the paint or the coating that came from reference missiles. So once again, I'd like to refer to the general findings of the investigation into the debris. In several debris, 341 steel fragments were found, of which the elemental composition and the manufacturing features were compared in two ways. First of all, amongst each other, compared with each other, and second with the fragmentation parts of the 9N314M warhead. And these fragments were, amongst others, found in the insulation material of the cockpit. Some of these parts also have a recognizable shape, and that shape could then be compared with the fragmentation parts in the 9N314 warhead. In the debris, several other non-aircraft elements were found, of which the external features and elemental composition were compared to several parts of the Buck missiles of the 9M38 series. Many of these parts were found in the front of the plane, the left, uh, front left-hand side of the plane. So now 
would like to proceed to the non-aircraft material that was found in the bodies of the victims and the investigation that we conducted in that respect. Reddy said that steel fragments were found in the bodies of the crew members of the MH17, and this was disclosed at an earlier stage by the JIT. In the bodies of crew members, 29 steel fragments were found, one of which was still recognizable as being a bow tie shaped fragment. You'll see it on the top left hand side. And this is a picture of the NFI, the Dutch Forensic Institute. The forensic pathologist found this fragment in the body of the captain of crew team A. This fragment was found subcutaneously in the left part of the lower body with a perforation channel from the abdomen of the victim based on the recordings of the cockpit voice recorder. It could be determined which crew members were in the cockpit just before the explosion. Of these fragments in the bodies of crew members, the Dutch Forensic Institute studied the different features and compared them with the fragmentation parts of the Ukrainian dismantled warhead. The fragments from the warheads were secured after the arena tests in Finland and Ukraine. Furthermore, the NFE, the Dutch Forensic Institute, studied the fragments um, and the features to see whether they uh, showed any features of the explosion. On the fragments, the NFI found re-solidified glass. The top photo, yeah, you can see it. The fragment that was found in the body of the captain of Team A. And this re-solidified glass was then compared with the cockpit glass of a Boeing. Besides the steel fragments, in the body of another crew member, a particle was found with a different composition than these fragments. The features of the stainless stainless uh, steel portions were compared with the sliding cover of the book missile. In the dismantled book missile, this, it slides over a base plate that I referred to earlier on, and we can compare, and we compare this with this cluster in the frame of the cockpit window. I'm summarizing it now. In the investigation of the bodies of the crew members in the cockpit of MH17, the following investigative measures were taken. In the bodies of the victims, 29 fragments were found, the features of which were compared to the different uh, fragmentation parts that were secured after the arena tests in Ukraine and Finland with the 9N314 warhead. And in the body of the captain, a bow-tie bow shaped fragment was found. Different fragments, including this bow-tie shaped fragment in the body of the captain, have traces of re-solidified glass, and this composition was then compared to the cockpit glass of the burning. One, in one of the crew members, a deviating a particle was found that was compared with the sliding plate of a book missile of this 9M38 series. If then we add up all these steel fragments that were found in the wreckages and the bodies of the crew members, the total number is 370 fragments. Two of which can be recognized visually as bowtie shaped, one in the front pressure bulkhead in the cockpit and the other one in the body of the captain of the MH17. And furthermore, there are a number of fragments that can be recognized as a tile or a rod. Fragmentation parts with the same shape appear in the 9M314 warhead. We then asked ourselves a question whether after detonation of a bulk missile in the vicinity of the aircraft, whether more fragments or specifically more bowtie shaped fragments should have been found. The 9M314 M warhead contains, and we know this from research and from other sources, contains about 8,000 fragmentation particles. 1,870 are, about, are more or less. Uh, bow tie shaped. We researched this. We looked at the spread pattern after detonation. We looked at weight loss after detonation and also the circumstances of recovery of the wreckage. 
and this led to the following results and findings. First of all, it appeared that the fragmentation parts spread in all directions around the missile, and as a consequence, most of these parts will not hit the target. Second, not all fragmentation parts that hit the MH17 ended up in the mortal remains of crew members or in the wreckage. And this follows from the abrasion traces and indentations in which we, we didn't find any impacts. Particles that were not wedged in the wreckages could have been lost during recovery and transport. The wreckages was, lif was lifted in the disaster area, loaded into trucks, and then transferred to train containers, and then transferred to lorry containers, and then brought to Gilzerae. You just saw the pictures, the last section of the transport. And then finally, not all wreckage was recovered. You saw that in the 3D scan that we just showed you. So besides the number of fragments that were found, we also looked at the number of perforations and abrasive damage uh, points that we found. So this can tell us something about the number of fragments that must have hit MH17. After investigation, the RMA reached the conclusion that the number of observed perforations in the wreckage of MH17 tallied with the number of perforations that you would expect in a detonation of a 9N314 warhead. And this way, in the opinion of the prosecution, sufficient investigation was conducted into the question as to why um, only 370 fragments were found out of the 8,000 fragments. An additional question is whether we shouldn't have found more than two bow tie shaped fragments out of the 370 fragments. Now, this was studied as well. As a consequence of the detonation and impact, the fragmentation parts from the warhead lose their original shape, their recognizable shape. The arenata showed that these particles also lose weight. The Dutch Forensic Institute conducted a study into the weight of the 370 fragments. Bowtie-shaped fragments, and you saw this on the pictures in the reference material, are larger and heavier than the tile and rod fragments. Now, besides the loss in weight, the Dutch Forensic Institute also took into account the possibility that the weight may have increased and that in impact other material is absorbed, such as glass, the glass traces that we found, or that after the impact and prior to the recovery of the particles that there was oxidation. And on that basis, the Dutch Forensic Institute reached the conclusion that the rod and tile fragments that were found could not have weighed more than 2.5 grams. All fragments that weighed more than 2.5 grams, according to the NFI, must have been bow tie shaped fragments. The NFI found another 16 out of the 370 fragments found. These 16 fragments no longer look like bow tie shaped fragments, but according to the NFI, based on the weight, must be bow tie shaped. And in actual fact, many more bow tie shaped fragments could have been found than the two recognizable fragments and the 16 unrecognizable fragments. And according to the NFI, the fragments after detonation um, could have had all sorts of shapes. And the fragments that weigh between 2.1 and 2.5 grams could have had a tile shape or a bow tie shape. So unrecognizable fragments that weighed less than 2.5 grams could originally have been bow tie shaped. So according to the Dutch Forensic Institute, out of the 370 fragments that were found, at least 18 bow tie shaped fragments uh, were possibly there, and possibly even more. We're summarizing the fragments. There are several explanations for the fact that out of 8,000 fragmentation parts, only 370 were found. First of all, the fragmentation parts after detonation will spread in all directions, so that only a small portion thereof will have hit the MH17. 
And of this smaller portion that hit the MH17, only a smaller portion ended up in the mortal remains of the crew members and the debris. And of this small amount of fragmentation parts that ended up in the wreckage during recovery, part of, the, part of these fragmentations may have fallen out. And not all wreckage was recovered. And furthermore, investigation into the weight of the individual fragmentation portions of a 9N314M warhead showed that at least 18 originally original bow tie shaped fragments were secured, or possibly more. I'm going to proceed. And then we end up at the findings for the uh, separate non aircraft materials. Because the various non aircraft materials that were found in the wreckage and the bodies of victims, we also found seven separate non aircraft parts between the wreckage at Gilserijen. Three of these seven objects were discussed before in the JIT presentation of September 2016. These are a green shroud of a missile engine, a Venturi, and a green colored stabilization wing. These seven, these seven non-aircraft objects visually um, were similar to parts of block rockets. As we've said before, we made a double comparison. On the one hand, to parts of dismantled block missiles of types 9M38 and 9M38M1, and on the other hand, two parts of 9M38M1 missiles that were detonated during the arena test. On the top picture, you see the reference material. These are the shrouds of the missile. The white part is of 9M38 and the green part of 9M38M1. And below you see the reference material that was secured after an arena test. In the last comparison, and I'm, we're looking at the engine shroud, in the middle of the part that was found separately, on the left-hand side, the reference material of the dismantled missile, and on the right-hand side, the same part that was found after an arena test. You saw it flying in the air with the red circle around it on the footage. And the last comparison of the engine shroud, it had other damage than the engine shroud that had been secured after the arena test. You can see it in the middle in the right picture. Now, that difference was investigated further by specialists of the Royal Military Academy in Belgium, and they believe that the damage can be explained because of the difference in aerodynamic circumstances between detonation in flight at a 10 kilometer altitude and static detonation on the ground during an arena test. Of various of these seven objects, of which I've only shown you three now, but in total there were seven separate non-aircraft objects that were found. The element composition and the paint that was found were compared once again to the parts of the reference missiles. Because based on the forensic investigation, it could not be excluded that these separate items could have already ended up in the disaster area uh, before or after crashing of MH17. The characteristics of these separate objects were also compared to each other and to other non-aircraft parts found in the wreckage. Parts that had been trapped in the wreckage, we knew that they were related to MH17. So, various non-aircraft material was found in wreckage, in bodies and possessions of victims, and separately in the disaster area. Characteristics could be compared to parts of Buck missiles of types NM, 9M38 and 9M38M1. In the investigation to the relation of these objects with the crashing of MH17, the characteristics of these non-aircraft materials were also compared to each other. Based on this comparative investigation, we could answer the question whether this non-aircraft material uh, 
originated from a Buck missile of the 9M38 series, or either a 9M38 or 9M38M1 missile. Although the charges do not request that, we also investigated the type of rocket of that 9M38 series these non-aircraft materials originated from 9M38 or its successor, the 9M38M1. And this led to the following findings. When we compared the three separate objects that were found visually, items that are shown, they seem to be more similar to the reference rocket 9M38M1 than to the 9M38. The casts of a metal shrapnel that was found of an antenna part and a metal connector linked exactly to the cast of a similar part of a 9M38 rocket missile, but were not similar to the older part 9M38. The same applies to an electric conductor that was found electronic transit main, because this transit main is similar, although it is similar to both type of uh, missiles, it is also different parts of it that were found, rectangular plates linked to cables, these plates are magnetic in the part that was found separately. The same plates of these transmitters in the 9M38M1 reference missile were also magnetic, but the ones in the 9M38 were not. Furthermore, as stated, two bow tie shaped fragments were found that are similar to the fragmentation parts of a warhead of the type 9N314M. According to Russian sources, this warhead is only used in the 9M38M1 missile. Also in the technical manual, that we've obtained of the 9M38M1 missile, only the 9N314M warhead is mentioned at the same time. During the dismantling of the reference missiles in Ukraine, it appeared that the 9N314M warhead can also be uh, fitted into a 9M38 missile. Finally, various non-aircraft materials were found with a green color, such as the trapped metal cluster in the frame of the cockpit window that I've just shown you and the separately found engine shroud and stabili stabilization wing. In the forensic investigation, the reference missiles of the type 9M38M1 were green all the time and the ones of the type 9M38 were white. According to Ukrainian sources, the 9M38M1 is painted in a standard green color by the manufacturer with a white nose, and the N9M38 is painted white. In Russian weapon brochures and open sources, we found images of the 9M38M1 in green with a white nose and in white with a red nose, but no 9M38 missiles were found in a green color. In short, in the comparative investigation into non-aircraft materials, we found more similarities with the Buck missile of the type 9M38M1 than with a 9M38 type. The casts of a connection part and an antenna part, the magnetic plates of a transmitter, the bow-shaped fragments of the, and the green paint link up better to a 9M38M1 than to a 9M38 missile. The investigation that we've now discussed was focused on non-aircraft material that were secured during the forensic investigation in the Netherlands. Also into the origin of these materials in the Ukraine, we have investigated. As stated, forensics experts had no access to the disaster area in eastern Ukraine, otherwise they would interfere with the work of the repatriation missions and the uh, Dutch safety board. Therefore, the origin of the non-aircraft material was investigated later, at a later stage, and at a distance. Non-aircraft materials that were found either in the bodies, the remains of the victims, or in the wreckage, it wasn't necessary to do so because the relation of these materials to flight damage 17 was obvious. Still, there was a comprehensive investigation into that.
of the non-aircraft materials that were found in the wreckage, it was investigated where and in what condition this, this wreckage was found in the disaster area. The Malaysian uh, investigators have compared pictures of wreckage in the disaster area to pictures taken during the forensic investigation of the wreckage. I showed you a picture of that before, and the report with the 1117 photos is included in the file, as stated. Furthermore, of four of these seven separate non-aircraft parts, including the engine shroud, we could uh, trace back on what locations these were found in April 2015 in the disaster area. Information about these sites was provided to the examining magistrate, and he has um, assessed what information could be added to the file without jeopardizing the security of persons. Of the other three separate parts, it could only be assessed that they these had been recovered somewhere in the wider disaster area. As stated, the relation of these separate items, objects, to MH17 has been investigated further by comparing its characteristics to other non-aircraft objects that were found in the wreckage of MH17. In the final stage of the forensic investigation, an investigation was performed into the origin of the non aircraft parts that were found in wreckage and bodies of victims. By investigating how these ended up in the forensic investigations, we could retrace the earliest site where they were found. An example is the left wing. As stated, we found various non-aircraft uh, parts in it and on the pictures of various witnesses and pictures from open sources. You see some pictures from open sources. So based on these open source pictures and witness pictures, you can see that it is depicted with the same damage at the same site of a chicken farm in the southwest of Aravo as of the 18th of July 2014. And this is where it was recovered, as we read in the final report. From the investigation to the origin of these likely missile parts or non-aircraft parts, it appeared that various non-aircraft parts ended up in the investigation, forensic investigation, via different origins. These parts were found in the bodies of victims, trapped in wreckage and documents of the crew, or separately in the disaster area. Now, those bodies, the wreckage, the documents, and the non-aircraft parts in which these were found, and the loose, the separate non-aircraft part, were found at various locations in the disaster area, came at different times and different ways to the Netherlands, and were also secured at different times and different sites in the Netherlands by forensic experts. So there was a comprehensive investigation to the origin of the non-aircraft materials found. Of these materials of which we could retrace the origin, it appeared that they traveled along different routes. The materials that were found in the remains of the victims or that those were trapped in wreckage, the relation of these parts to flight MH17 is obvious, according to the PPS. That leads us to the last question that was investigated in the forensic investigation, the establishment of the firing site. We discussed earlier that the Dutch National Aerospace Laboratory called NLR and the Belgian Royal Military Academy, the RMA, performed an investigation separately. We will now discuss that investigation. Besides these two institutions that participated in the forensics investigation of the GIT, the Russian buck manufacturer Almas Antei calculated a launch area. Since the result of this calculation by Almas Antei was engaged in the investigation to various launch sites and also the ones by NLR and RMA, we will discuss all three of these investigations. The Dutch National Aerospace Laboratory investigated possible launch area earlier 
in the context of the research by the Dutch Safety Board, they had limited details. They arrived at an area of 320 square kilometers south of Snitsen. In the criminal investigation, the NLR uh, performed further investigation based on additional data, and they used the following details. The impact damage to the wreckage, the impacts, the craters, the abrasive damage, the damage on the aluminium sheets after the arena tests, the spread pattern, the speed that was assessed of the fragmentation parts and the angles um, at which they were ejected in the arena tests, the thrust profile of the engine missile that was measured in the arena test, the specifications of the 9M38 and the 9M38M1 missiles based on technical manuals, these were secured, the atmospheric conditions on the 17th of July 2014, and the 3D scan of a Boeing 777. Based on that, the NLR created simulation models of the flight of the Buck missile and of the ejection of the fragmentation. Next, Buck launches were simulated uh, from various sites and launch angles, and they were compared to the actual damage to MH17. And if this damage was similar, that location would be in the possible launch zone. So that's how NLR arrived at an area of 75 square kilometers, so smaller than earlier calculated, based on added additional data. So an area of 75 square kilometers to the southeast of the position on which MH17 emitted its last signal. And you can see that on the map. The last FDR position means the last position based on the flight data recorder of MH17. Only Buck missiles that were fired from that area, so the 75 square kilometers that you see here, only Buck missiles fired from that area can have caused that damage to the MH17 according to NLR. The agriculture field, the farm field of Pervomarski, is in that area, and it will be discussed later when we discuss the investigation to the main scenario. Before the further calculation of NLR, Almas Atay, the manufacturer, had mentioned a different area. At press conferences of the 2nd of June 2015 and the 30th, 13th of October 2015, they stated these. And these press conferences were at the same time of the time when the DSB allowed insight in the uh, draft report on the 2nd of June and when it issued its final report on the 13th of October 2015. In the investigation of the DSB, Almas Antai had been engaged and they had taken cognizance of the intermediate findings of the Dutch National Aerospace Laboratory with regard to the firing area. According to Almas Antai, the damage to MH17 could not have been caused by launching from the direction of Schnitzne. According to the calculations of the manufacturer, it must have been launch from another area south of Saroshenske. And that area is outside the launch zone that was calculated by the NLR. And you can see that location on the map. The area of Almasantai is a bit south of that location. Later, so after the report of the NLR, the Belgian Royal Military Academy calculated there air, an, another area. It was, the institution had been engaged with the arena test of the GIT, and they also engaged the details of Almas Atay when establishing the model of the flight of the Buck missile. The Royal Military Academy arrived at the launch zone that is part that partly overlaps the one calculated by the NLR, and the one calculated by Almas Atay is outside the area that they calculated, once again. 
Now, we arrived at our intermediate conclusion with regard to forensic investigation. In the investigation, four questions were leading. Was it caused by an explosion? If yes, was it an onboard explosion or an offboard explosion? Based on forensic investigation, can we assess what type of weapon was used? And based on forensic investigation, can we decide uh, what the firing location was? In order to answer these questions, comprehensive investigation has been conducted into the damage pattern of MH17, non-aircraft materials found in wreckage of MH17, non-aircraft materials found in the bodies of the victims and some personal belongings of the victims, and the separate non-aircraft materials found in the Ukraine. For the benefit of this investigation, a large collection of reference material was created, and it consisted from various buck missiles and warheads that had been dismantled and detonated, uh, particularly uh, in relation to this investigation. The main um, elements of the investigation to the damage pattern were the following. Investigation into shooting found on the outside of the fuselage, investigation whether this shooting had traces of explosive, investigation into perforations, craters, and abrasive damage in and on the fuselage, mainly on the left front side, investigation into steel remains found in the craters and the perforations, Invest comparison of these characteristics of these steel remains with those of fragmentation parts of a 3-9 of a 9N314M warhead of a buck missile. And finally, comparison of the peddling effect found on the wreckage with the damage of um, caused by a buck missile and warhead after Arrhenia test. The important elements of the investigation of the wreckage were investigation into 341 steel fragments found in various wreckage parts, the comparison, mutual comparison of the characters, including the element composition of these steel fragments, comparison of the characteristics, including the various types of uh, fragmentation parts of 2 and 9M, 314M warheads, comparison of the characteristics of other non-aircraft parts of various parts of buck missiles of types 9M38 and 9M38M1. The main um, elements of the investigation, the examination of the bodies of the victim, mainly of the crew members in the cockpit of the MH17 are the following. Investigation into 29 steel fragments found in the bodies of these crew members. The relative comparison of these characteristics, including element composition of these steel fragments to the characteristics of reference material fragmentation part of a 9N314M warhead, comparison of the element composition of newly solidified glass traces found on steel fragments in the bodies of the crew members with the element composition of cockpit glass of a Boeing aircraft, comparison to the characteristic including element composition of a part that was found in the body of one of the crew members with the characteristics of a part of buck missiles of the types 9M38 and 9M38M1. Furthermore, seven different non-aircraft materials were found separately in the disaster area. The characteristics of these objects were compared um, relatively uh, with and also compared to the characteristics of buck missiles of types 9M38 and 9M38M1. In the investigation, we, uh, we performed three arena tests. We um, found data that were of interest to further investigations, such as the speed of fragmentation parts after detonation and the angles uh, at which these were ejected, these fragmentation parts. One of the further investigations pertained to the um, calculation of the launch zone. It was performed by experts of the NLR, the Dutch uh, National uh, Aerospace Laboratory and the Belgian Royal Military Academy. Both institutions calculated the area within which a bug missile of the 9M38 series must have been fired in order to cause the damage as observed on the wreckage of MH17. The NLR arrived at an area of 75 square kilometers to the southeast of the position on which MH17 emitted its final signal. And only bug missiles fired from this area 
can have caused the damage to MH17, according to the NLR. The result of the calculation of the Belgian Royal Military Academy overlaps this area partially. The Public Prosecution Service means holds that the forensic investigation has been complete and that based on the results that we summarized, all investigative questions can be answered. And perhaps this is a good time for a break. I think so too, yes. I was wondering whether we should have a break when you were still talking. You've been talking for nearly two hours, so I propose that we will now adjourn. I think for about 30 minutes. I don't know how big the next part is that you would like to explain. I think that the planning was to um, end the hearing today at about 5 o'clock. Yes, indeed, then we would do it in parts because the telecom part is about 45 minutes long and the next part in itself will also be about 45 minutes. Well, if we resume at 20 to 4, two times 45 minutes would be a quarter past five. That should be okay. So then we would have two completed parts. We will try to do so. We will restart at 20 to 4. Thank you.
Funk. Thank you, Klaus. Please be seated. The hearing is resumed, and uh, the floor is now for the prosecution. Shall I start? Yes, please do. We are now going to start discussing the telecoms investigation. The analysis and validation of telecommunications in East Ukraine was an important part of the investigation. And this is all set out in detail in the telecoms file. The telecom data requested in this investigation can be classified as audio, that's tapped conversations, and metadata, which is data generated about telephones, telephone numbers, telephone conversations, and transmitter masks contacted by mobile telephones. As early as the 17th of July 2014, it was clear that the SBU, which is the security service in Ukraine, which does both intelligence work and detection, was able to provide to access relevant tapped conversations. On the very same evening, tapped conversations were made public. That was possible because the SBU, right from the begin of, of the armed conflict, had been investigating the armed groups which were involved in it. This involved major large-scale telecommunications interception in East Ukraine, including the telephone lines of the accused Gikin, Dubinsky and Karchenko. After the MH17 was downed, departments of the SVU were given the instruction to listen to all telephone conversations which had been recorded which might be relevant in order to gather evidence regarding the downing of MH17. Because particularly the telephone lines of Dubinsky and Karchenko had openly been the place of discussion of downing an aircraft and the possession of a book missile system, it was no surprise to find that relevant conversations were identified very quickly. The first selection of telecom data which was relevant to MH17 investigation was done by the SBU. As the JIT investigation got up and running, the investigation into relevant telecom data was researched more and more by 
investigations in different countries together. The principle was to assess conversations in their context. A relevant conversation could often be seen as the beginning of further analysis, not as a result in itself. Analysis of this kind could be carried out by listening to other conversations on the same line and also conversations, other, other conversations of the other party and metadata regarding the mobile phones which could be analyzed. The substance of conversations made it possible to identify many of the telephone users and that made it possible to review their conversations in the context of information from other sources. As I said before, the Ukrainian SBU carries out both intelligence and detection work. In both fields of work, the SBU is entitled to tap telephone conversations and request metadata. This means that both in intelligence in and detection work, they have to have prior authorization from a Ukrainian judge. The Ukrainian telecom da data in this case come from three different sources. You can see the three sources on the screen. One is the SPU's intelligence work. Another is a criminal investigation by the SPU into the downing of the MH17 and other criminal investigations carried out by the SPU. Telecom data arising from the SPU's intelligence work have found their way into the file through two routes. The first phase of the investigation, July and August 2014, saw the SPU's intelligence section providing telecom data to the Dutch security service, the AIVD. The AIVD then passed this information on to the Dutch public prosecutor. In addition, the Ukrainian authorities have repeatedly shared telecom data with the JIT. The telecom, gegevens, the telecom data which was shared with the JIT had been gathered by the SBU both in intelligent work and in criminal work. Declassification. In order to make it possible to share Ukrainian telecom data with other JIT partners, they first have to be released in Ukraine. And the process of releasing or declassification varies according to the source of the data to be released. Telecom data, which was gathered in the intelligence work of the SBU, had first to be released by the SBU before they could be made available to the JIT as evidence. Telecom data arising from other criminal investigations, apart from the MH17 investigation, could only be made available to the JIT as evidence after a Ukrainian judge had given authorization. And telecom data gathered in the MH17 investigation in MH17 did not have to get an additional judge authorizing them for availability to the JIT partners, but a decision by a Ukrainian public prosecutor was required. So, for gathering all telecom data in both intelligence and criminal work, authorization was required from a judge in Ukraine. Before the Ukrainian public prosecutor could provide the data to the JIT, you either had to have an additional scrutiny by a judge or you had to have the authorization of another Ukrainian public prosecutor or the SBU. And the de declassification process and the analysis of a large number of Russian language telephone conversations was extremely time consuming. Now, many telephone conversations were listened into because of the armed conflict, but that does not mean that there was a clear overview of who the participants in the conversations were. In Ukraine, many more conversations were recorded than could actually be listened to. We, we would talk about uh, bulk interception. The advantage of this was it was possible to search out relevant conversations long after they'd taken place. The disadvantage was the SBU had no clear overview of everything which was being discussed on the lines it was intercepting. In addition, it turned out during the course of the JIT investigation that many people in the armed group, including our accused, used 
secure telecommunications. And that is clear from their conversations that were intercepted. I'll give you a couple of examples that you can see and listen to. In a conversation on the 18th of June 2014, they talked about the use of secure landlines and secure mobile telephones. In a conversation on the 3rd of July 2014, it was mentioned that special telephones were being used which were not available on the market and which were provided by the Russian security service FSB. It's clear from this conversation that these telephones are in use by many high-level people in the DPR. A conversation of the 12th of July 2014 revealed that some secure telephones can be used for secure encrypted conversations and also for normal unsecured conversations. И у тебя должен быть надпись на звонке «Закрытый» и «Пиликать должен». Вот сейчас мы с тобой разговариваем по открытой связи. Странно, я ничего не менял. Ну, ладно, Блин, сейчас перезаговорю. Сбоку, сбоку, справа, кнопка, она меняет цвет экрана. Я понял. Ты сейчас Все, разговариваешь давай, тогда. Давай, по открытой. Давай, давай. давай. And in a conversation of the 16th of July 2014, you can hear the difference. This conversation begins without securitization, but very quickly the security is installed whereupon an irritating noise is heard. This explains why many of the intercepted conversations in the investigation I beg your pardon. This explains why many of the conversations intercepted in this investigation don't have any comprehensible conversation. All you hear is this kind of noise. This shows that encryption is being used to prevent interception. It is clear from these conversations, then, that not all telephone conversations between the accused and other involved could always be monitored. We have a great deal of recorded communication, but we also know that we are missing out on a lot of conversations because they took place on encrypted lines which cannot be intercepted. Another complicating factor in the investigation is that the armed conflict makes a great deal of use of call signs. That means most people in the armed group in East Ukraine don't use their real names in telephone conversations. That made it complicated and time-consuming to identify the participants in the calls. Now, I'll move on to validation of telecom data. Earlier, we mentioned the importance of validation investigation for all evidence, and telecom data is no exception. Because we made extensive use of telecom data in this investigation, its authenticity was tested in a number of different ways. Information was requested regarding the locations of transmitter masts, 
and network measurements were carried out. Telecom and data and metadata was compared and cross-referenced in various ways. Data from Ukrainian providers was compared with data requested from foreign, non-Ukrainian providers. In a, number of ways, in a number of ways, it was possible to identify that a number of participants in intercepted conversations recognized their own voices. A number of participants have also confirmed the content of the conversation and thus confirmed that the conversations genuinely took place. And in addition, we looked in public sources to see about events that were discussed in the conversations actually took place. I'll now go through each of these validation methods in greater detail. I'll start off with the identification of transmitter masks, uh, masks and network measurements. When a mobile telephone is active in a network, it gets, makes a contact with the antenna on the telecom provider's transmitter mast. The location of this mast gives an idea of the physical location of the mobile telephone and is therefore very relevant to the investigation. In the JITS investigation, therefore, Ukrainian providers were asked to provide information on the locations of their transmitter masts. In addition, Dutch police telecom experts carried out network measurements in Ukraine. A network measurement of this kind makes it possible to investigate after the event which transmitter mast antenna was contacted at the moment that the telephone is, uh, is at a certain location. You can also identify which transmitter mast antennas along a certain route are contacted at the moment that you travel along the road with your mobile phone. In order to get the most accurate and recent data possible regarding which transmitter mass antennas have been contacted, it's important to carry the network measurement out as quickly as possible after an investigated event. Now, because of the war situation and because relevant areas and locations could only be identified as a result of the JIT investigation. The network measurements could only take place over a year after the event. That is to say, from the 11th of June 2015 to the 1st of July 2015. That is the reason why the results of the network measurements have to be treated with caution. The network measurements are carried out at locations which were identified as being possibly relevant and also along the route which we suspect the book Taylor had travelled along. On the screen you can now see the locations on the basis of the transmitter masts at each location. Location 1, a field to the south of Snizhny. The place is called Pervomaisky. 2, the centre of Snizhny by the Furshet supermarket. 3, a field to the north of Snizhny. And four was to the south of Zaroshensky. Then we investigated a route in the Donetsk region and Luhansk region, which had been identified in an early stage of the JIT investigation as a possible route on which a book Taylor had travelled in the relevant period. In addition, measurements were carried out around concerning a company in Donetsk. This is a location which is believed to be the origin of the low loader on which the book Taylor was transported. Here you see the route circling that company. The investigating team were not authorized to carry out any network measurements in the, regio, in the Luhansk region. The local armed group would not allow it, and it was therefore not possible to carry out any measurements along that route. That's the red part of the route on the screen. Those are the parts of the route where it was not possible to carry out any measurements. The data thus gathered was used in the investigation in order to investigate whether the transmitter mast data that we had was compatible with the network measurements. 
This was always bearing in mind that in this case, we didn't have, we were never going to be able to get a complete picture, and also not entirely up to date for 2014. Firstly, because the measurements could only carry out, be carried out at a later stage, and secondly, because in some of the route through the Luhansk region, it was not allowed to carry out any measurements, and finally, because there was no location in the investigated area in the relevant period with a detective signal from the provider Kivstar GSM, although the provider was, was active in that region in 2014. After all, we have telecom data from Kivstar from 2014. Nevertheless, the network measurements in 2015 yielded a great deal of relevant information regarding the locations of transmitter masks and antennas which could be used for monitoring and verification and verification of the transmitter mast locations as provided by the Ukrainian providers in the relevant periods of 2014. All in all, then, the investigation involved a great deal of work in order to get the most detailed and reliable conclusions possible regarding the telecom data, among other purposes, in order to identify the location of telephones that have been used. At the same time, it is clear that care is required in determining a location on the basis of transmitter mass data. That's the case in any criminal investigation. The fact that a telephone has contacted a particular antenna on a transmitter mast does not always mean that the telephone is very close to that transmitter mast. A transmitter mast might be contacted across a long distance. It might be, for example, because a transmitter mast which is nearby is uh, unavailable or, or not working. And, this is another, and there's other reasons for caution as well. So we shouldn't therefore interpret the presence of a, of a transmitter mass as on its own. It must be looked at in the context of questions which are being answered. Simple, therefore, is to say, if it is clear from a tapped conversation that a suspect is in a convoy in a book tailor and is on the way to a place where the convoy has been seen, it is relevant additional evidence if his telephone contacted a transmitter mast at times which are compatible with his conversation and what witnesses have seen. Transmitter mast data can also give you relevant information regarding the telephone's movements and presence in a particular geographical area. As regards the prosecution in this inv investigation, it is not relevant to use the simple fact that the telephone contacted a particular transmitter mast as firm evidence that the telephone was located at that place at the time. Another method of validation was the comparison and matching of telecom data including cross-referencing. If two telephones are in contact, there's a number of ways in which the provider records the conversation. One is based on the IMEI numbers of the telephones used. Another is the telephone numbers, which belong to the SIM cards in the telephones. And another is on the basis of the transmitter mast and antenna, which both telephones contacted. And in the historic telecom data used in this investigation, we find all these forms of registration. When telephones are being intercepted, you also gather information regarding the conversation itself. For example, the duration of the call and the start and end times. In this way, a large amount of telephone conversations are registered in or recorded in several ways. And these different forms of recording can be cross-matched and compared in order to see whether they are consistent or whether they show any incomprehensible discrepancies. That was done on an extensive scale. Now, comparative studies could take place, for example, by investigating whether a particular EMEI number, which belongs to a telephone device, had the same data coming in as on the telephone number which is connected to it. And the telephone number belongs to the SIM card in the device. You can see that in the upper table on this slide. 
An example of cross-referencing is if the data from a particular telephone shows that it contacted a particular transmitter mast, then you look at the data for that transmitter mast, and you see whether the, ma the mast was contacted by that mobile telephone at that exact time. That is in the lower part of my slide. A Dutch reporting officer with extensive telecom investigation experience who has spent a great deal of time analyzing and checking the Ukrainian telecom data has drawn the conclusion that the quality and integrity of the telecom data received from the Ukrainian authorities is equivalent to the standard of comparable material that is used in Dutch criminal investigations. Now, the comparing data from Ukrainian and non-Ukrainian providers. The JIT investigation showed that the telephone lines intercepted had also had contact with foreign, that is to say, non-Ukrainian telephone numbers. We therefore asked the foreign providers whether they had also recorded these conversations. For example, Polish and Spanish providers showed data to reveal that their records of the conversations did match in terms of date, time and telephone number. You can see that in picture form here as well. If a mobile telephone in Ukraine calls Spain, and we ask Spain for the metadata regarding the conversation, then the metadata from Ukraine should be the same as the one, as the stuff from the Spanish provider. And this was another way in which we could check the integrity of the telecom data that we had received. Next, we investigated whether the people involved in the investigation rep recognized voices in the conversations, and many times they did. The investigation team collected public sources wherein various participants in intercepted telephone calls confirmed that they had had the conversation. I'll give you an example. The JIT identified rebel leader Kozitsin as a participant in a telephone conversation on the 17th of July 2014. The conversation took place at 17.42 hours, in which they talk about a transport aircraft with Malaysia Airlines written on, and they say that they shouldn't have been flying. A journalist interviewed Kozitsin and played a recording of the conversation to him, and he replies that he did indeed have that conversation, and he recognizes his own voice. Вы, наверное, видели эту запись, запись, которую СБУ выдавала э, за ваш телефонный звонок. Это правда были вы? Ну, я был в таком деле. Ну, просто там в этом разговоре вы говорите о том, что сбит был, э, то есть непонятно был, кто был сбит, и что якобы там казаки как-то были связаны с этим. Не, не, не так говорю. Вот. Мне просто было данное, только, только, только самолет сбили, и мне просто преподали данные, что сбить самолет не подумал. Я просто сказал, что не хрен летать на территориями, где идет война. Угу. Вот это мои слова. Вот. вот и все. А вы знаете, кто сбил? О, ракета. Ну, кто это сделал, вы не знаете. Э -э ну, без комментариев. In response to social media, many suspects confirm that they have carried out certain conversations or they deny it. And these 
responses have been recorded in the file. In addition, a number of witnesses were interviewed and they recognized voices in, re in conversations which had been recorded on the JIT website or which had been played to them earlier. There are also participants who recognized their own voices in recorded conversations. Whenever possible, we confronted participants in intercepted conversations with the content of the conversation, asked them for their comment. One example is Igor Bezler. He confirms when interviewed that he, carried, that he was involved in a conversation about downing a, an aircraft, but he said it took place on a different day from the date identified by the tapping. The investigative team then looked once again to see whether they could analyze all the available telecom data and information regarding the substance of the conversation to see whether the conversation had actually taken place on a different day. And it turned out not to be the case. A number of other examples of conversation participants confirming their conversations when heard are to be found on file. Next, the JIT investigated whether events that were discussed in the intercepted conversations had really taken place. This was a way of verifying the content of a conversation. For this purpose, we compared a great many conversations with data available from other sources, very often public sources. We could therefore see that a great deal of what was discussed in the conversations was confirmed in the other sources. Another, a number of examples. On the 27th of July 2014, the accused Dubinsky telephoned with an unknown known as Andreevich. In this conversation, the person contacted said that he had had a phone call, a phone call from Moscow to say that a Dutch journalist was missing, apparently Jan Hunin. Andreevich said that this is a problem they really don't need. And Dubinsky says that he will look into it. On the 29th of July 2014, the journalist Jan Hunin had an article in the Volkskrant newspaper saying, you know, the headline, Jan Hunin, I'm in prison, luckily I deleted my tweets. And here he says how he was detained by armed men in DPR territory for a few hours. Thus, the conversation between Dubinsky and Andreevich is confirmed. Jan Hunin was imprisoned in East Ukraine during that period. Another example. On the 13th of April 2014, the accused Gierkin was telephoned from a Russian number, and he speaks with a person who he calls Konstantin Valerievich. The conversation concerns a conflict situation which has just taken place and says that people have been wounded. According to Konstantin Valerievich, Avakov said that the head of the Ukrainian anti-terrorism center is dead. Есть. Константин Ванович.
uit een artikel van het persbureau ITA-TAS van 13 april 2014. Een artikel van het persbureau ITA-TAS van 13 april 2014 confirmt dat de Ukrainian minister van Foreign Affairs Arsen Avakov had announced on Facebook that the head of the Ukrainian anti-terrorism center and other uh, and, and other officers have been wounded. On the 13th of April 2014, the BBC published a similar article where Avakov's Facebook story was reported, was repeated. The TASS and BBC articles therefore confirm what the accused Yekin said to Konstantin Valerievich. There had been a conflict and people had been injured and Avakov, the Ukrainian Minister of Foreign Affairs, had announced that the head of the ATC had been wounded among other people. Then, on the 16th of June, 2014, a Sushka, an Su-25 aircraft, was downed in the vicinity of Horlivka. The pilot ejected himself by parachute from the aircraft, both in intercepted conversations and in a published article. This is a subject under discussion. On the 16th of June 2014, at 9.27.34 p.m., Dubinsky telephones with a person they call Sasha. In this conversation, Dubinsky asks conversation whether Pergi, which is Girkin, will report that Bess has downed a Sushka in Golovka, Holivka, and that the pilot has bailed out. По другим каналам подтверждения есть. Летчик катапультировался, летчика ищут. Чувство процентное подтверждение. Слышишь, да, на горловке? Алло. Сегодня понял, да, доложу. Сейчас вечером уже. Сейчас так? вечером. Понял. Так. On the 16th of June 2014, the BBC monitoring from the Soviet Union produces an article saying militias in East Ukraine report downing one aircraft hitting armored vehicle. Again here, we can see that the subject of the conversation is compatible with the news that was published regarding a Sushka aircraft being downed and a pilot ejecting from the aircraft. These examples serve to show how further investigations on the content of intercepted conversations produced a great deal of information which is relevant in assessing the veracity and evidentiary value of the conversations, identifying the individuals involved in intercepted conversations was done on the basis of comparing these conversations with sources from with information from other sources. For this identification process alone, Countless conversations were compared with other sources, and the results were positive. You can see the findings in the identification report, where hundreds of conversations, conversations were listened to in order to identify a number of people who were involved in the armed conflict, particularly on the DPR side. Now, within the investigation, we carried out validation of the DAPT conversations received from Ukraine in many ways. Articles and documentaries distributed on the Internet also gave us incentive to examine to what extent allegations of manipulation of DAPT conversation could be investigated. General accusations of manipulation, for example, simply saying that all the tapped conversations were false, could not be investigated in any meaningful way. Specific and detailed accusations could be. Back in March, we explained that we had taken an open view to see whether public allegations of manipulation of telephone conversations could be investigated and that we had brought forensic experts in from the Dutch Forensic Institute to carry this work out. In the light of the above, we have given you an overview of the various ways in which validation work was done on the telecom data received from Ukraine. We sought information from telecom providers in Ukraine and carried out network measurings, as a result of which we could see which transmitter masts had been contacted at relevant locations. This 
makes it possible to identify the physical location of telephones which are relevant to the criminal investigation. By comparing various sources of telecom data from Ukraine, we were able to say with a high degree of certainty that certain conversations had indeed taken place at certain times between certain numbers and devices and by contacting identifiable transmitter masts. By seeking telecom data from countries other than Ukraine, we were able to investigate whether international conversations could be identified in the Ukrainian telecom data, and they were recorded in the same way in the non-Ukrainian countries where the other participant was located. By interviewing participants in relevant telephone conversations, whether they recognized their own voices, it was possible to see who they were talking to. There were also witnesses interviewed regarding recognizing the voices of other participants in conversations. And by comparing the substance of a number of conversations with information from open sources, it was possible for international investigators in the JIT to see whether the content of the conversation was compatible with other data from the same period. Finally, we looked into allegations of manipulation of the intercepted communications, and these were investigated by forensic experts who brought expert advice to bear. The quantity of conversations analyzed by the team, the interplay between these conversations, the connections between these conversations and other sources of data, and the fact that for the great majority of these conversations, they were selected from a much larger number of conversations for investigators from other countries in the Ukraine, makes it extremely unlikely that the the conversations that were shared and analyzed by the JIT could have been manipulated. The prosecution therefore takes the view that the most extensive investigation possible has been carried out in order to assess and identify the authenticity of the telecom data. This brings me to the witnesses and the investigation into the witnesses. From the beginning of the investigation, it was clear that finding witnesses would be complicated given the war conditions in eastern Ukraine. Nonetheless, the JIT made a great effort to find witnesses, which generated encouraging results. The JIT deliberately used several methods in its search for witnesses in order to be able to reach anyone with relevant information. The first way in which witnesses were found was via the Ukrainian authorities. Several witnesses reported to the SBU, were approached by the SBU, or were arrested by the SBU in investigations into other offenses in Ukraine and were then interviewed as witnesses with respect to the downing of the MH17. The second way in which witnesses were found was by means of the help of other countries. Several other countries were asked about um, possibly relevant information for the investigation. In this generated statements of witnesses that were then staying in those other countries. So amongst others, the Russian Federation provided several witness statements. All these statements from all these other countries were included in the investigation and incorporated in the file insofar as relevant. As in any witness statement, obviously we did check whether the witness had information that could actually contribute to the investigation. If a witness, for instance, stated to have heard only a blast or to have seen the downed aircraft fall from the sky but not to have seen what happened before that, such a statement was not incorporated in the file. A third way in which we looked for witnesses was by means for calls for witnesses. Over the past few years, at several points in time and in many different ways, appeals were made to witnesses to report. General appeals were made that were spread through several international press conferences. The appeals were posted on websites and internet fora via social media. There were radio commercials. There was, was a distribution by means of printed cards 
calling for witnesses um, that were distributed in higher education institutions in eastern Ukraine, and also targeted calls were used that were sent by, v by email, social media, SMS messages to thousands of people in eastern U Ukraine that, uh, based on the telecom information and data, could possibly be considered to be a possible witness. And the responses of these calls for witnesses were then registered and processed by the Dutch police. Fourth method, the investigation team, based on open sources and investigative results, approached individual persons to make witness statements. These were, for instance, people who were mentioned by other witnesses as persons who could be identified as potential witnesses uh, by means of publications or social media. Upon request of some witnesses, the statements made before the Dutch police were incorporated in the case file but are not shared with the Ukrainian authorities. Now, this was granted in a request, and that in itself says nothing about a possible risk that these witnesses might run, but it's simply prompted by the wish to be able to make sure that uh, we have as many witnesses as possible that can make a statement about in relevant information. This very varied method of working has led to dozens of relevant witness statements from persons from very different uh, places. Witnesses were not only heard in Ukraine, but also by telephone, by internet connections in different countries. By combining different ways of looking for witnesses with different ways of carrying out the witness interviews, any witness that wanted to to make a witness statement could be involved in the investigation. Among the witnesses in the, state, in the case file, we have citizens from Ukraine and Russia, people who fought on the side of the DPR, Ukrainian militaries, air traffic controllers, journalists, critical followers of the JIT investigation, radar technicians, and military experts. There are witnesses that have stated that they saw how flight MH17 was downed by a fighter plane. There are witnesses that make a statement about the transport of a buck tailor, witnesses that were at the firing location on July 17, 2014 at Pomaisky, and also witnesses that state, make a statement about their personal involvement with the contacts with the armed group of the suspects and the Russian Federation with respect to the removal of the box to the Russian Federation in our contacts with the witness. We worked as safely and securely as possible throughout the investigation. In the hearing in March, we already discussed the safety and security risk for witnesses in the investigation. We shall now explain how we have made sure in the investigation that the statements of anonymous witnesses could be realized in a careful uh, way so that those statements could be used. Protection of witnesses in these criminal proceedings has been realized in different ways. Of a number of witnesses, the identity details are known um, with the Dutch police, with the police, but in the official report of the interview, a unique G number was used. In other witnesses, this given the risk was insufficient and the investigating judge pursuing to an arrangement in Article 149B of the Code for Criminal Procedure, it was requested to allow that certain information in that statement would not be included in the case file, information that could lead to the identity of the witness. You'll see this here. The investigating judge in those cases did not interview the witness himself, but read the police uh, interview and other relevant documents and then assessed whether the removal of information, redacting that information, was actually necessary or whether the information to be removed was not exculpatory and whether the statement, as it would end up in the file, actually is a honest and fair reflection of the full statement. And if the prosecution so wish and, and the defense so wish, additional questions can be asked to these witnesses and the reliability of these statements can also be assessed on the basis of the rest of the evidence in the file. Wherever the witness code with the letter S is used, protection based on Article 149B uh, of the 
code of criminal procedure has taken place. Furthermore, a number of witnesses um, have been protected by the investigating judge according to a procedure for threatened unnamed witnesses, as included in Articles 226A to 226F of the Code of Criminal Procedure. You can see this on the screen. These witnesses, after the interview before the police, were once again interviewed by the investigating judge himself. Most of these interviews conducted by the investigating judge took place in 2019. This was not the first point in time in which those witnesses came up in the investigation. All these witnesses have made statements earlier on in the investigation before the police, some of them even in 2014. The investigating judge has always first checked the identity of the witness, you see this on the screen here, and has determined for each and every witness whether it was actually really necessary to make a statement anonymously. The investigating judge also checked how the witness was found by the investigating team, what the contacts of these witnesses have been with, with others and what the reasons are for this witness to make a statement. That the identity details of these witnesses are not revealed in the file doesn't mean that there were no checks and balances in terms of who they were and what they state in their statement. In the Dutch legal system, an independent investigation, investigative judge meticulously in researches and studies the identity of an unnamed threatened witness and also the question whether their anonymity is necessary and the contents of their statement. The investigating judge not only personally interviewed the threatened anonymous witnesses, but also uh, conducted his own study and research into the reliability of the witness and made a report of that included for the uh, case file. The, examining ju the investigating judge checked whether the statement made by the witness before the investigative judge is consistent with earlier statements made by the same witness before the police. And also the investigating judge assessed whether the statements made are coherent, logical, plausible, consistent and detailed, and whether those statements are consistent with evidence from the case, from the file and um, public sources. And the investigating judge could use the documents and telecom data of the witnesses that showed their presence at a certain point in time and location. The investigating judge makes a separate anonymized statement with respect to the detailed interview of the witness. The anonymized statement has been included uh, in the reliability study conducted by the investigating judge. The public prosecution and the defense were not present during these interviews, but additional questions can be asked. This category of so-called 226A witnesses are always indicated with uh, the letter V, with the exception of witness X48. The witness codes in the investigation have been chosen in such a manner that one cannot infer from the code when a uh, witness appeared in an investigation, and the codes, therefore, are not chronologically incremental. For instance, there are, are no witnesses called X1 through X47. An appeal can be filed against the decision of an investigating judge to interview a witness anonymously. Pulatov did this, and according to the law, such an appeal must be dealt with by a closed session of the court, different judges not being the judges in the trial hearing. In a public hearing in March, other judges of the Court of the Hague have taken a decision with respect to the appeal of Pulatov, and their conclusion is that the investigating judge has conducted sufficient investigation into the threats against the witnesses, and in one case a procedural mistake was made, and for that reason the granting of the status to witness V11 upon appeal has been uh, annulled and reversed. And in these proceedings, there's a substantial number of anonymous witnesses, but there's also an independent investigative judge that has all the available information on the witnesses. And this investigative judge has uh, always checked whether the 
uh, anonymization which was applied was actually necessary and in accordance with the law. And the work of the investigating judge has been checked in the appeal proceedings of Pulatov by three judges that have judged whether the rights of Pulatov have been respected. Besides forensics finding telecom data and witness statements, the investigation was also aimed at collecting relevant photos and videos. And that's what I will discuss now. We tried to find information that gave information about situations, circumstances in the air and on the ground. We focused on pictures and videos of Ju the 17th of July 2014 of the airspace in which MH17 was shot down. It did not provide images of MH17 or other aircraft, but of smoke and condensation traces in the air. We also tried to find footage that could provide information about the circumstances on the ground in Ukraine and the Russian Federation in a wider period. This um, provided us with a number of large number of pictures and videos of various topics, such as wreckage of MH17 buck systems, and very specifically of a buck system that was transported on the 17th and 18th of July in the eastern, eastern Ukraine of a scorched farm field and of interviews of suspects and other DPR fighters. This footage was acquired in various way, ways. A large part thereof was secured from the Internet. These images had been published by various persons, such as journalists and local, in, and local citizens. How this investigation into digital sources uh, was uh, conducted, we will explain later. Other photos and videos were collected in other manners. They have sometimes been sent directly to the GIT following the calls for witnesses, or they were provided by the witnesses during interrogations. Here and after, when we discuss the investigation into various scenarios, we will give you some examples. And then we will describe when and in what manner the relevant photo or video was acquired for the investigation and how it was validated afterwards. By means of these examples, we can provide you insight in the manner and the progress of the investigation. Finally, for today, we will discuss the investigation into digital sources. The investigation into the cause of MH17 took place with the entire world looking onto it. Besides the official investigation bodies such as the um, Dutch Safety Board and the GIT, private persons also contributed to that. They did um, publish their uh, investigation results on the internet. Journalists reported on their own observations of a bug system shortly before the crash, their own investigation into possible firing sites and interviews with witnesses about attacks from the air and from the sky. Private persons published messages on social media, which included uh, statements, photos and videos of a bug transport and the condensation trail of a possible missile. Also, members of the DPR issued statements about the possible cause. Russian and American authorities expressed themselves and mentioned possible causes of the crash. As such, the investigating team had to cope with a large number uh, of information items, uh, which was public, which was spread on social media and news services, and they had to make choices. First of all, we chose to have an open view because the investigating team was investigating various scenarios. They needed a wide net. Publications on the internet about MH17 could not be just put aside and therefore were, these were secured. Secondly, it was important that that secured information was stored and also retained. Now, the investigating team could not immediately have this, all of this information translated and assessed immediately after publication. Moreover, it only became clear um, when the investigation proceeded what information was relevant and what information was not relevant. And therefore, the information that was published on the Internet had to be comprehensively copied and saved for later translation and analysis. Thirdly, the approach that was chosen was dynamic which meant that copies had been made at various times, because what was on the Internet on the one time could already have been 
have disappeared at some time later or have been altered. As such, relevant social media messages that had been published briefly after the crash of flight MH17 have been removed later or adapted later. We will show that later when we discuss the various scenarios that were visible in the first responses after the disaster. That is why we had to press the pause button continuously. We needed images at various times of potentially relevant pages. We used software programs to do so. By means of search terms, pages were collected and copied. Within these copied internet pages, we searched more detailedly. In the first phase of the investigation, only public and easily accessible pages to the public were visited and secured. The internet investigation did not take it any further than the pages that an average user would call public. Access to relevant social media was only made by uh, passive accounts. As such, access was gained to the public spaces of that medium. In the first phase of the investigation, it was chosen not to use these accounts to get access to smaller groups. So initially, only information was collected that was accessible for everybody on the internet, albeit with a registration that could be made by any um, random citizen. In this May, um, a large uh, collection of public information was secured. These saved data were analyzed at a later stage, and it provided a lot of relevant information. It included notifications of witnesses and video and uh, picture footage, two statements by suspects and other um, engaged persons. Later in the investigation, we searched more focusedly and uh, more in-depth to information about persons. We use special um, statutory investigation powers. If required, um, permission was asked from the investigating judge. In the BOB file, the file with regard to the use of special investigative powers, we have included an overview per suspect of the powers that were used. As such, we acquired, for instance, access to the closed parts of Internet fora. Thank you. I do understand that we have finalized your explanation for today a bit earlier than expected, unless there is anything we need to remark right now. Uh, if not, I will now um, adjourn, and we will continue tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock with the continuation of the explanation by the Public Prosecution Service. So now we've adjourned this hearing.